call me out upon the waters, the great unknown, where feet may fail, and there I find you in the mystery, in oceans deep, my faith will stay. Grace abounds in deepest waters. Your sovereign hand will be my guide. My feet they fail and fear surrounds me. Never fail and woes are now. And I Savior's birth. 
that hail our Savior's birth. Well, good morning and welcome to Legacy Church Online. I'm so glad that you're here to join us today. Uh, what a great opportunity once again to gather and worship. I know it's a crazy weekend just in terms of all the things going on and lockdowns and Christmas and uh, I dared to go near Costco uh, today and uh, the lines, uh, I didn't join them, but the lines were incredibly long. So at, at any rate, tis the season, right? And I'm just so glad that you're here to celebrate Advent with us today. Uh, Jesus came into this world, came in here into this world for you and for me, and that in and of itself is just an amazing and great story that we want to celebrate. So will it to be so, Christmas is going to be great this year in whatever form that takes, because the story is still true. I want to encourage you to go on to the front page of the website. Uh, that should be an ongoing part of what you do in terms of connecting with Legacy Church. Uh, on that front page, there's a number of ways to get connected, uh, reach out, uh, file a prayer request, uh, give online. There's just so many things that help make that experience of going there a true connection of what's going on at Legacy, including an outline for today's message. So just let me encourage you to take a moment and get there before we get too far into the service if you haven't already done so. And just a, a couple of other things just want to mention. One is a change of mailing address. Uh, that's really important because uh, the old mailing address in La Mesa is no longer so. Uh, we have a new mailing address because we have official occupancy uh, at a new site uh, at the La Mesa Spring Shopping Center. So use the new address uh, to get to us via the, the, uh, the Postal Service. Uh, and then lastly, it is Advent and it's about families and it's about the people that we love and a God that we uh, adore and honor. And so we celebrate Advent. One of the ways we do that is a family uh, from the church each week. Each time we meet, uh, both outdoors and online, uh, have a chance to share a little bit of themselves 
and to light the Advent candle. And so it will be true the same today. Hey, I'm so glad that you're here. Uh, enjoy the hour. Uh, feel the presence of Jesus as you honor and worship him even now. Have a great day. Hi, Legacy family. We are the Joneses. I'm Matt, my wife Phoebe, Ransom, Jubilee, Pax, and Verity. And joy is important to us. Um, obviously, our kids' names reflect special meanings, and jubilee means joy. And we have a story that we tell with them that the greatest gift we ever received is that Christ paid our ransom so that our lives could be full of joy, peace, and truth. And that's really important. And the only reason that we have joy is because Jesus came and lived here on earth with us and paid our ransom. And it makes us think of Christmas carols, right? One of the most popular Christmas carols is Joy to the World. The Savior reigns. So celebrate with us that there is joy in our world because the Savior reigns. Okay, you want to help me? Okay, we like this one. Ready? Merry Christmas. Oh, come, let us adore him. Oh, come, let Hi, my name is Chris. I'm one of the pastors here at Legacy Church, and it is unsurprising that this year both Merriam-Webster and Dictionary.com declared that their word of the year is pandemic. I feel like they had a lot to choose from, right? Whether it's pandemic or PPE, personal protective equipment, or COVID-19, coronavirus, uh, filters, masks, anything. Uh, but the thing is, it got me thinking. It got me thinking about all these words and how they've entered into our vocabulary. And, and I started thinking on that, uh, on that idea of masks. I feel like a lot of things in our lives have been filtered as of late. Our understanding of our world around us, our, our perception of reality, of our relationships are running through a new filter this year. The filter of not being able to see people, 
right? And in addition to that, we filter pretty much everything we can as, as individuals in the United States. Filter our water, we filter our air, we filter uh, everything else uh, under the sun. But one of the things that I think that, uh, that our text this, um, this, uh, this morning, this afternoon, this evening, whenever you're watching this, uh, gives us an opportunity to do is, is to, to question one thing that we filter that I think God intends us to be unfiltered in, and that's joy. Uh, I think you and I were created to be receptacles of God and God's joy. Uh, I think that's intentionally why he created us, to, to pour his love into us and so that we might experience joy. Jesus even said, I came that you might have joy and joy to the full. And uh, I think what we get to do in the season of Advent is recognize that Advent causes unfiltered joy. Advent is the cause of un, is, can be one of the causes of unfiltered joy. Advent, uh, coming, right? The, the coming of Jesus, Emmanuel, God with us. God breaking into human history and, and coming in the form of a baby. We get the opportunity for that invading, that Emmanuel, that God with us to cause some of those filters that we put up to our joy, our expression of deep set happiness uh, to be stripped away so that we might experience the fullness of joy in God. The, the reason I think that is because I think Mary, uh, the mother of Jesus, uh, some of her filters towards joy were stripped away when she met uh, an angel uh, sent by God. And that's where we pick up our story in Luke chapter 1. Uh, Luke 1 verse 26 is where we start. And this is what it says. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, a relative of Mary's, another miraculous story who a woman in her old age is, uh, is, is made to be able to have children. And so Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. I think one of the first things that we see here in this story and one of the invitations that uh, comes to us in the season of Advent to break down these uh, filters towards joy is God introduces and confronts Mary with befuddling favor, with confusing favor, with perplexing favor. I just liked the word befuddling, so I decided to use that one, but befuddling favor. And I don't know if you've ever experienced this before, I certainly have these, these moments where you feel like you, you've, you've given, been given too much favor, right? There are just some friendships where I feel like I haven't really given too much to this and you just seem to be a really big fan of my life and it's extremely life-giving but also kind of perplexing, right? Uh, when I was thinking about this in, in times in my life too, besides interpersonal relationships, I also think, uh, thought of a couple times in my life where I've actually won something. Um, and both Apple products, to, to be specific. So one was when I was in school at UC Santa Barbara, I wrote my name down and my phone number on this thing at the Dining Commons, a, a raffle, right? I get a phone call from a random number. If you're anything like me, you don't answer phone calls from random numbers, but for whatever reason I did. And I answered and they said, hi, is this Chris? And I said, yes. They kind of paused. Uh, Chris Ward? Yes, this is Chris Ward. Hi, you won an uh, iPod. And I was like, yeah, okay. And I was going to hang up, right? I didn't believe it. And for those of you who are too young to know, uh, back, way back when you had to have a phone and an iPod. It wasn't one and the same. So one was for music and one was, was, was for phone calls, which you can do on your phone. Anyways. Um, so I would won an iPod and, and, and they said, wait, 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 no, it's the dining commons. You filled out this piece of paper. Sure enough, I went and I won an iPod. The second uh, experience was really similar, except it was an iPad uh, from a local Thai restaurant here in San Diego. And it was like six months after I put my name in. And I was just, they, they just said, hi, is this Chris? And I said, yes. They said, you want an iPad? And I said, okay, right. Like, like their declaration of, I mean, it is nothing. An iPad or an iPod is nothing compared to an announcement from God that he is favoring Mary, but it's a teeny glimpse, teeny glimpse of what it feels like to say, wow, 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 this is, I don't really believe it. It's too good to be true. And you can see that in a response. I mean, it's, there's a declaration of you are highly favored. And then Mary, it says Mary was greatly troubled. 
It greatly troubled. I think it's what's important to understand is the definition of favor. Uh, the definition of favor here is to pursue with grace, to surround with favor, to honor with blessings. And so for an angel of God to come and say you are highly favored, that's, that feels too good to be true. Uh, it probably almost maybe feels like a bait and switch. Why would God be interacting with me? Honestly, just think about when you've been called into your boss's office, right? I'm, Kurt Gruber, my boss, has been nothing but good and kind to me. And, and we've had serious conversations, but he's been nothing but encouraging and good. And yet, because he's my boss, when, when he says, hey, I want to I wanna meet, I want to have a, a talk, I still get a little nervous, right? And, and even still, he's usually there to encourage and support me. But it's still perplexing. It's still mildly troubling. And so it's not surprising that she was greatly troubled at his words. And listen, he, he reassures her and says, uh, don't be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. Hold on. No, this is what I need to tell you first. And I think for so many of us, we need to hear that message from God first and foremost. And we don't. That we are highly favored. Whether it's songs that we sing that talk about how much God values us and we go, well, 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 I'm not that great. And it's like, no, 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 you're not. <laughs> but God highly favors you and I. He, out of his heart, loves us. It's so interesting. The Bible tells us that God is slow to anger and abounding in love. Meaning he's slow to anger. It, it takes a lot. He's long-suffering. He holds back anger. It, it takes a while for him to be provoked even. And, and he's abounding in uh, love and in kindness. And what that means is that his heart is like spring-loaded towards kindness, right? Towards, towards abounding in kindness towards us. Every opportunity we give him to be kind to us, every time we mess up and every time we make a mistake, every time we willfully sin or, or hurt another person or anything, he's ready to be kind because that's what his heart does. And it just is so hard for us to believe because aren't we just the opposite, right? We're, we're slow to love and abounding in anger, <laughs> or irritability, or frustration, or impatience, or whatever. And that's a result of our alienation from God. But what God is coming back to do, and what Advent does, and what Jesus came to do, was to make sure we understood that with God it's the exact opposite. He, he is abounding with kindness, and with, uh, we have found favor. This quote from a Puritan theologian, Thomas Goodwin, really hit home for me when I was processing this. He says this, that which keeps men off is uh, off, far from God, that they know not God's mind and heart. The truth is he is more glad of us than we can be of him. The father of the prodigal was the forwarder, forwarder of the two to that joyful meaning, meaning he was the initiator. He went first. Have you a mind, he that came down from heaven, as himself says in the text, to die for you, will meet you more than halfway as the prodigal's father is said to do. Now hear this. Oh, therefore come in unto him. If you knew his heart, you would. It might be befuddling. It might be confusing. It might be hard to believe, but his declaration over us is favor, and we see that perfectly in the coming of Jesus. So let that be spoken over you this Christmas season. Now the next thing that we see in um, this story is, uh, is an invitation to, uh, to a kingdom. And, and while, we, uh, while we process this coming favor, I almost forgot this. This is really important. This is really important. Um, you see, Mary, her response, we, we have to make a response to these invitations to having unfiltered joy, right? And so for this befuddling favor, Mary had to believe in coming favor that was going to be fulfilled in the life, death, resurrection of Jesus. Um, but you and I get to benefit from certain favor, He's already proved his love in the person of Jesus, his life, death, his resurrection, and his filling of his Holy Spirit in us. And I just didn't want to miss that. I just didn't want to miss our opportunity to respond to this. So uh, benefit from certain favor. We move forward in verses 31 through 33 into a conversation about kingdom. 
So we see, you will conceive and give birth to a son, the angel said to Mary. You are to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. You see, it's, it's really easy for us to think, okay, the angel declared favor, so now um, he's probably going to talk about love or joy or peace or patience or kindness or gentleness or grace or something else. And, and all of those things are extremely true. And, and they're probably some of the first things that you heard about when you first started hearing about Jesus. But that's not where the angel goes next. The angel goes to a conversation about the kingdom which I've, I've preached on it before. I'm not going to dive into all the ins and outs of what life in a kingdom looks like. However, just know that Jesus talks about the kingdom of God in the scriptures more than any, any other topic. Any other topic. It's the kingdom of God that he cares about. And so what we see here is, is kingdom language, right? Uh, Jesus, he will save is what that means. Um, he will be great and will be called son of uh, God. Uh, son of the Most High, excuse me. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. Reign over Jacob's descendants. His kingdom will never end. The reason I say transcending kingdom, uh, I chose trans transcending on purpose because transcending means to go beyond the limit of, meaning uh, overstep its bounds, right? So we see that in two ways in this conversation about kingdom. One is that we see that, that heaven is uh, transcending Earth. It's invading earth. It's overstepping its bounds. God is taking his throne. He's indwelling by a person, right? You're going to have a baby who is going to be the son of God. So heaven is transcending earth. And we see that that's really important as Jesus talks about an unfolds kingdom because the point of his ministry is to inaugurate, to start his kingdom rule on this earth. We see it imperfectly now. It's not done yet. We know what is coming as we look to the scriptures to know that God wins, that God wins about over all other things. But we are invited to experience that kingdom here and now. But the other thing that is in a transcending uh, in this moment and, and specifically in the context of Mary's life, and I think you and I can relate as well, is God's will, his plans, his purposes are transcending. They're overstepping their bounds into Mary's plans and our plans, and my plans, right? Mary was a teenage woman in the Middle East uh, in, well, it was about to be AD zero, right? <laughs> but she was a, a teenage woman, and what she understood from her culture, the way that they had arranged um, life in, in this culture was that uh, she, Mary, and, and women in general would be cared for by their fathers until they were married. And then they would be cared for by their husbands. And so Mary is looking forward to a marriage which symbolizes a lot of things. It symbolizes her, her security, that she's going to be cared for for the rest of her life by her husband. And if something tragic happens to him by his husband's, or her husband's family, uh, it looks like uh, peace and, and hope for a future, right? I mean, you think about where you're going to live and the, the things you're going to accomplish with your life, the children she's going to have, the life that they're going to build together. She knows that Joseph is a stable and trustworthy man, right? We know that because later it says that when Joseph was told about this, he thought, okay, I'm going to uh, separate from her quietly because I don't want her to be put to shame. And so he wasn't out to slander or ruin her. So Mary knows that, knows he's a good guy and he's going to be stable because he's a carpenter, right? I think one of the other things is that maybe she thought, well, maybe there's hope in this moment because here's the thing. It, it, it says that uh, she was pledged to be married uh, to Joseph, a descendant of David. That's in verse 27, a descendant of David. It had been prophesied in this book, the Bible, that, that the savior of God's people would come from the line of David, from the genealogy of David. And I can't help but think that maybe somewhere in the back of her mind, Mary thought, this might be my opportunity to get into God's plans, get into what God is doing in this world. But she probably could not have anticipated, look, anticipated it looking like this. Uh, I went ahead and called my sister-in-law, Raina. Uh, it's Katie's twin. Um, and 
she got engaged uh, just a few months ago, four months ago, I think, and, um, and she's getting married in just another few months in March. And she's looking forward to this marriage. It's, it's going to be amazing. Uh, she has found an incredible man uh, who is going to love Jesus uh, as much as she does and lead her in that way. He's, he's stable financially, um, but she is because she's a strong, independent woman. You know, let me just say that. But uh, she, she loves this man and she's really looking forward to it. They've done the cake tasting. They've done the venue looking. She's done the dress shopping. Uh, they've got this planned out and she's looking for it. They even have an apartment, you know, to, to, to move into once they're married. Like they're, they're setting themselves up. And so I called her and I asked her, okay, so with all of that in mind, what if God came to you and said, hey, uh, you're pregnant and it's God's son. I said, what do you, how do you respond? Uh, the first, the first uh, <laughs> response I laughed so hard at because it's so, she's so, she's so on it. Uh, she said, well, thank God I'm employed somewhere that I have paid time off, right? <laughs> that was her first thought where I could take care of this baby. And she said, well, then seriously, okay, um, how? Like, seriously, how? How is that even possible? She's like, okay, what else? Um, then she thought about the messenger, right? She said, well, who are you? Who, are, who is this messenger? Because God's never talked to me like this before, right? Then you better believe that's the same of Mary. <laughs> She'd never been talked to by the angel Gabriel, uh, who's mentioned elsewhere as, as an upper-ranking angel in God's uh, army. Uh, she had never been you know, greeted like that before. And uh, then she thought, well, how do you tell Cody, uh, her, her fiancé? How do I tell him? How do I talk to him about it? And then she had a really honest answer that I think was, was in line with everything else that she was thinking. But she said, do I really want this? Probably not. I mean, it's hard to feel excited about having a baby and not being married. Um, the wedding sure as heck looks different, right? <laughs> Let out the dress a few sizes. Um, but this kind of ruins my plans. <laughs> this kind of ruins my future. And as much as I'd like to say that I... Um, I want to do exactly what God would have me do. That's, that's a tough pill to swallow um, when he comes in with something so utterly opposed to my own plans. And yet, uh, I just happen to think that, that that's how God works most of the time. I think that's what we see in Scripture. And I was reading uh, a man named Henry Blackaby this week, and, and he was talking about experiencing God and, and doing his will and this is what he says, and it just struck home. He said, I have known some people who wouldn't interrupt a fishing trip or a football game for anything. In their minds, they say they want to serve God, but they eliminate from their lives anything that would interfere with their plans. God has a right to interrupt your life anytime he wants. He is Lord. When you accepted him as Lord, you gave him the right to help himself to your life. And I just thought for myself, wow. Uh, I know God speaks to me regularly, and I just wonder how frequently I say yes. Just for the, the sheer fact that it's God who's asking me to, I don't think I'm batting anywhere close to 500 there. I don't think five out of ten times I'm saying yes to God. And yet, he has every right to. And think about it. What, what if Mary wouldn't have been interrupted? Right? What if she wouldn't have interrupted her wedding and her plans for anything, not even God? Where would that leave you and I? The Son of God had been refused by Mary. You see, what happens in this moment is this kingdom come, this king that is going to be born to her, this virgin. Um, in this moment, she, instead of thinking, okay, I'm just not about this and I'd rather chase after the other uh, things in my life that give me joy and the joy of, of a marriage, which is also a huge celebration in this culture as well as ours. But she instead gets to engage this kingdom conversation because what we see is she says, how will this be, Mary, asked the angel, since I am a virgin. She doesn't just say no. She doesn't say, well, I, I doubt it. She doesn't laugh like Sarah did in the Old Testament. She says, how? How is this going to happen? She engages the kingdom conversation well, you and I get to enact this kingdom come because the fact of the matter is, is she did say yes. 
she did say yes, and this baby was born, and the Savior was given to us, and, and we were given hope by his, again, life, death, and resurrection. And so you and I get to participate in this kingdom now, doing the good and beautiful work, coming to people even in the midst of their plans, because God has come to us in the midst of our plans and said, go and tell people how much I love them. Go be friends with those who, who no one on uh, this earth would be friends with. But if you see Jesus, man, he spent so much of his time on this earth befriending sinners and tax collectors and eating with the uh, criminals and prostitutes. That's an invitation to enact the kingdom of God for us in, in our lives this holiday season. And I think it's an invitation for some of our filter to be uh, torn down when it comes to joy, because if we're willing to say yes to God, then we might experience more of the joy of the Lord in our lives. Now, the last thing we see, uh, the last kind of final hammer stroke uh, we see to um, Mary's filters to joy is, is overwhelming presence. In verses 35 through 37, it says this, Then the angel answered, The Holy Spirit will come on you. The power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One will be born. Uh, so the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age. And she who was said to be unable to conceive is in her sixth month. For no word from God will ever fail. So instead of the Lord coming in and, and Mary asking this question, how will it be since I'm a virgin? He doesn't, he, doesn't, uh, he doesn't get snarky with her. He doesn't get sarcastic with her. He doesn't say, too bad, you don't get to know. I'm not going to talk to you about this. I'm shutting you off. This is happening. Or, uh, bye, I'm gone. You asked a question. No, he, he loves her. He answers her question. And the way that he does so is not just power. Right? Because what we see here is the power of the Most High will overshadow you. But that's, that's not the point of this, this dialogue, this, this snippet of conversation here. The point here is the presence of God. It's overwhelming. It's all-consuming, right? The, the Holy Spirit will come on you. The power of the Most High will overshadow you. And what we see here is the fullness of God represented. Right? We, we believe as Christians in a God who is one God in three persons, a beautiful, difficult mystery of our faith, but one that gives us hope and helps us to know a bit more of who our God is. But what we see here is all three represented. The Holy Spirit will come on you. So the, the Holy Spirit, the very Spirit of God, the one who is given to us uh, at Pentecost. That's, that's a time in Scripture where the Holy Spirit comes. It's the Spirit of God himself comes and lives in us when we invite him to, which is amazing. Jesus was limited as a, as a man to one place at one time, but the Holy Spirit can be in every single one of us always. So the Holy Spirit will, will come on to this, this, or this uh, virgin named Mary. And the power of the Most High. Most High was, was a phrase used to refer to God himself, God the Father, Most High. So now we've got Spirit, we've got Father. Most High will overshadow you. And so that's a lot of presence. That's the presence of God. And one of the things that I love thinking about is that throughout the Old Testament, God, I, I'm sure he was working throughout the earth and not every story of God was written down in Scripture, but a lot of it was. And what we see a lot of, we don't see constant presence with people specifically. We, we see constant presence in the tabernacle and the temple, these, these dwellings that people built for God to exist in. But it's not like Moses was sitting in the ta uh, tabernacle in the temple all the time. His presence might have been there. God's presence might have been there. But only at specific times and through specific ways were people allowed to be in the presence of God. And so right here, without Israel having that kind of relationship with God ever before, Mary is made a promise, the Holy Spirit will come on you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. My presence will come to you. My presence will be with you. My presence will miraculously make this happen. But I don't want to miss something that's really important to the Advent story. It's the presence of the Holy One to be born who will be called the Son of God. This is in reference to the one who would be growing inside of Mary's body. I will never be able to understand 
the intimacy of growing another life in my body. And I know very, very little by the process of my wife growing our son. But Mary is given this opportunity to not just be um, have the Holy Spirit come on her to have the, the, the Most High overshadow her, but to have the Son of God embedded into her womb to, to depend on her life through an umbilical cord for, for her body to take some responsibility for shaping the God himself in the form of a human. It's mind-blowing, and it is miraculous, and it is unbelievable, and just as Mary was impregnated by God himself and was nurturing his presence in her body, so too you and I have the Spirit of the living God in us at all times, and we are given the privilege and responsibility to nurture His presence in us always. And, and so this final point, you know, she's, she's been given befuddling favor. It's like, okay, I'm, I just need to learn how to accept that. This transcending kingdom, I, I need to get to a place where I can say yes to the will of God in my life. Well, now she is given overwhelming presence, and, and this is what bursts the dam for Mary and what we're invited into, into experiencing, practicing, delighting in unfiltered joy. Because the, the joy that we have in God comes from his presence. It's why God decided to come and to be with us. It's why God said, you know what, after a period of hundreds of years where, where Israel actually experienced total silence, which was preceded by exile, which was preceded by terrible kings, which was preceded by chaos and flooding of the earth, which was preceded by brokenness and failure in the garden, God says, you know what, after all this separation, the joy that I want to give to you is going to come through my presence. It's why uh, the Psalms tell us that in the presence of God, the full, there's fullness of joy, and his right hand are pleasures forevermore. It's why the New Testament tells us that um, Jesus came so that our joy might be complete. And it's why uh, in the Old Testament it's declared that the joy of the Lord is my strength, because the joy is the equivalent of, of Emmanuel, of God with us. And we see it in her response. She says, I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May your word to me be fulfilled. Then the angel left her. Uh, that, that word servant is really important because the fact of the matter is, is she has come to a place where she was ready and willing to say yes to whatever God was going to have for her. And, and it's this same idea as when uh, Paul in the New Testament says, I am a doulos, which means servant of God. I mean, I, I'm willing to surrender all because you know what? That presence, that presence is what's going to bring me joy. And so, yes, I will say yes. And we know that Mary didn't say it um, uh, half-heartedly. We know it wasn't backhanded. We know that it wasn't with some reservation. We know that it wasn't begrudgingly that she said, I am a servant of the Lord. Because the very next thing that we see from her is a song. And let's be honest, we don't sing unless we're feeling it. What, whatever that is, whether we're feeling really sad, really happy, whatever it is, we, we sing with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength when we're feeling something. And as a worship leader, believe me, there's, I can sense the difference in myself and I can tell the difference in you guys in all love. And so Mary, with all of our heart, sings a song and it's not a dirge. She's not bemoaning the fact that she's, her, her old life is gone. That God has ruined her plans. No. It is a song of joy. 
She says, my soul glorifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior, for he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. It's not a fluke that she used that word. She means it. From now on, all generations will call me blessed, for the Mighty One has done great things for me. He's invaded my life. He has blown up all my plans. He has told me where I'm headed. And that is great and beautiful and wonderful. And it leads to unfiltered, synonymous with crude or native or natural or raw or unclarified or undressed or unprocessed or unrefined or unfiltered joy. That's what Mary experiences as a result of God invading her life. And so my hope and my prayer is that you and I would would use this Advent season as an opportunity to let God tear down the walls, tear down the filters that we've put up to joy. I mean, why do we do it anyways, right? Right? What, because no one else is is that happy as I might feel right now? Because other people might judge me because uh, I'm not supposed to be that joyful. It's, It's because I'm supposed to be miserable when terrible things are going on in my life and not have hope. It's because whatever. But why on earth would we make an excuse for not experiencing joy and giving God every opportunity to fill us with joy in the best of seasons and the worst of seasons? Because you better believe that it wasn't all easy going from here on out for Mary. She's probably judged and ridiculed, given side long glances in the streets, outcast from social cir- circles, given up on by friends. And yet her joy prevailed because it was the joy of the Lord. And so my prayer is whatever that is uh, that brings you joy in the holiday season. And I'm not saying every other um, thing on earth that gives us joy is bad, but I pray that we would experience the joy of the Lord through them, right? Through, um, through your favorite holiday meal and drink, through your favorite holiday tradition, through um, unpacking the, the ornaments that are the representative of the most fond memories for you, to the unfiltered joy you see in your kids when they open presents on Christmas morning. My prayer is this Advent, um, you and I would be given the gift of unfiltered joy in the rubble of our best laid plans to achieve joy for ourselves. Would you pray with me? Almighty God, we are so humbled. We're so thankful. We're so befuddled (laughs) by your favor, by the joy of the Lord, how it turns into strength. You're just, you're, you're far too good to us. And yet you keep lavishing and your ways are higher than our ways and your thoughts are higher than our thoughts. And that's actually a verse in reference to your favor your kindness. And so would you explode every category that we have of the joy of the Lord, every understanding we've ever had, every comparison we've ever made, and give us a baffling enlargement of joy this holiday season. And please, please, Holy Spirit, tear down these filters. Give us the strength to say yes every time you give us the opportunity And may we be a people who, instead of judging or looking down on each other when we experience joy, would we be people who um, find it infectious and contagious and learn to dance with each other through life because our Lord has come and he is with us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Joy, joy.
to the world, the Lord is come. Let earth receive her King. Let every heart prepare Him room. And heaven and nature sing, and heaven and nature sing, and heaven and heaven and nature sing. Joy to the world, the Savior reigns. Let men their songs employ. While fields and floods, rocks, hills, and plains repeat the sounding joy, repeat the sounding joy, repeat, repeat the sounding joy. Joy to the world, the Lord has come. 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 He rules the world with truth and grace and makes the nations prove. Of his righteousness and wonders of his love, and wonders of his love, and wonders, wonders of his love, and wonders of his love, and wonders of his love, and wonders, wonders of his And so as we just sang in celebration, joy to the world, celebrating the fact that Jesus came in the form of a baby, that is what gives us that unfiltered joy that Pastor Chris was talking about today. And I want to encourage you this week, go and share that unfiltered joy with those around you. Maybe it's just a smile at someone. Maybe it's buying someone a coffee in line behind you. Maybe it's just waving at a neighbor. Let the Holy Spirit use you to share that unfiltered joy that you have in Christ. We also recognize that for some people, maybe it's, it's hard. There are still barriers or things that keep you from experiencing that unfiltered joy. Once again, we'd love to connect with you if you have a prayer request around that type of situation. We'd love to pray along with you and for you during this season. Thank you so much for being with us today. God bless you. Have a great week. Oh, come let us adore Him. Oh, come let us adore Him.
give 